Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne. It's July 20th, 2012. During the midnight screening of The Dark Knight Rises at the Century 16 movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, James Egan Holmes set off tear gas and shot into the audience. It was the deadliest shooting in U.S. history. In this four-part series, we're joined by former Aurora Police Chief Daniel Oates and Denver Division FBI Special Agent in Charge Jim Yacone to talk about heroes, horror, and hope. Welcome to Behind the Crime Scene. I'm Gina Osborne, retired FBI Assistant Special Agent in Charge and former Army Counterintelligence Agent. Today's show begins a four-part series into the Aurora, Colorado Movie Theater Massacre. We have two powerhouses in the law enforcement community to walk us through this horrific incident and its aftermath, where 12 people were murdered and 70 people were injured. Our guests on the show today are Daniel J. Oates, who recently completed his highly successful 39-year career as a police executive. Dan began his career in New York at the New York Police Department and rose through the ranks to become the police chief in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Aurora, Colorado, and Miami Beach, Florida. The chief now runs a private law enforcement security and consulting firm called Daniel J. Oates & Associates, LLC. We also have Jim Yacone, who was the special agent in charge of the Denver Division of the FBI when this catastrophic event took place. Prior to joining the FBI, Jim was a West Point graduate and war hero. He's the recipient of the Silver Star, Bronze Star, and Purple Heart, to name just a few. Jim served for more than 20 years with the FBI, rising to the rank of Assistant Director in Charge of Global Critical Incident Response. Jim now serves as the Chief of Mission for the Sands Institute. Nationally syndicated artist Randy Bish drew a very profound cartoon depicting this incident not long after it occurred. Imagine the lobby of a movie theater with a movie poster on the wall featuring Batman as the Dark Knight Rising. There's a sign above the poster that says, now showing. We see the doors to the lobby with an Aurora police officer running out, carrying a child in his arms. The caption, and then the real hero showed up. This is a story of horror, heroism, and the hope of humanity. Now let's go behind the crime scene with former Aurora PD chief Dan Oates and special agent in charge Jim Yacone to talk about the Aurora 16 theater shooting. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us, Gina. It's July 2012. One of the most horrific events imaginable takes place in your community. Chief Oates, what happened at the Century 16 movie theater that night? It was 1238 in the morning. Previews had just started for the premiere of The Dark Knight, the latest Batman movie starring Christian Bale. Whatever the Hollywood rules were, were, they couldn't premiere a brand new movie until after midnight. So it was a midnight showing inside the Century 16 Theater in Aurora. The complex uh, had about 1,100 people inside it. There were four screens simultaneously showing the movie. Previews were underway where the movie had begun after the conclusion of the previews, and a gunman opened fire inside the theater, trying to shoot as many people as possible. The circumstances that led to that moment, the shooter had, we now know, had cased out the theater days earlier. He had gone into Theater 9, where the shooting occurs. He bought a seat earlier in the week online, and one was one of the first in the theater, and sat in the front row facing the screen. When the previews began, and he was in street clothes, He exited the emergency exit to the right of the screen out into the parking lot behind the theater where the only car that was parked was his. He put a stopper in the door so that he could get back in. He suited up in full ballistic armor, head to toe, including a gas mask, a ballistic helmet, ballistic leggings, armament, and he came back into the theater with three weapons, a shotgun, an AR-15 with a 100-round drum magazine, and a Glock 40 caliber pistol, and quite a few extra magazines of ammunition. We know that at around 12.38 in the morning, uh, while the opening scene of the movie is underway, 
he tossed a uh, large canister that was a combination of both smoke and some sort of uh, CS pepper spray. Very, very disorienting. The witnesses in the theater tell us that the crowd was all hyped up to be there for the, uh, the, the premiere of the new movie. Some folks were even in costume related to characters from the Batman series. And some folks actually thought that when the shooting began, it was some sort of live theater celebrating the opening of the movie. We know that the suspect opened up with the shotgun and fired six rounds of high-velocity birdshot at the crowd and then transitioned to the AR-15. We know that he fired 65 rounds with the AR-15, some of which is captured on audio with the first phone call to 911. In the midst of all this pandemonium, the shooter, still having a tremendous amount of firepower and ammunition, suddenly stops shooting. Uh, we know that there is a period where he pauses as he's moving around the theater and shooting because the rifle jams, and he's bent over the rifle. And by that point, uh, there are only a handful of people left in the theater who are fully mobile, and they use that last moment to escape. Everyone else who's left in the theater is either killed or severely wounded. And somewhere, depending upon who you talk to, sometime around 30 seconds to a minute and a half, he is not shooting. And then he apparently gives up. And we surmise that what happened in that case was he had dropped the drum magazine and tried to slip in a 30-round magazine that he had overloaded with 31 rounds of ammunition so it wouldn't seat properly. All of this kind of indicates he wasn't very sophisticated with weapons. The fact that he opened up with birdshot instead of a more deadly shotgun round like double O buck is a sign that he wasn't very sophisticated with weapons. And the fact that he allowed these other events to occur to jam the rifles suggests that as well. So he transitions to the handgun and fires, I believe, five additional rounds at people as they are fleeing the theater. And then our best available information and evidence is that he now exits the theater out the back or the emergency door to the right of the screen and into the back parking lot where his car is. We surmise that the first arrivals, once the call went out, were in the neighborhood of 30 seconds to a minute. 9, Chief, how quickly did your officers respond? The first call comes comes into us at 1238. Uh, by the time it's dispatched, we had an officer right down the street on a traffic detail who was one of the first to the theater. And the, all of this occurs within half a mile of police headquarters and the second district of the Aurora Police Department. At the time of the incident, how many officers did you have on duty? Probably worth your listeners knowing a little bit about Aurora at this point. Aurora is a city at the time, uh, in July of 2012, of about 350,000 residents, a department with about 640 or so officers at the time, uh, of which 124 were working at 1238 in the morning. And I think you were also in a summer surge period, right? So to uh, kind of bring down the violence in the city of Aurora, you know, luckily, Dan had extra officers on duty as part of the summer surge effort. What do your officers find when they get there? By the time we arrive and the officers with everyone fleeing out of the building, including many people who are shot and the absolute chaos associated with that, 
it's somewhere around the four minute mark or the five minute mark that the officers enter the theater, theater nine, where all the people uh, who could not get out of the theater are in there and huddled down under the seats and are, are wounded or dead. And we surmise that it's at precisely that moment that uh, the shooter exits the theater into the parking lot where he's promptly arrested because part of the comprehensive response is there's a whole bunch of officers who are trained and directed and go to the back of the theater where he's apprehended. Chief, your officers were on scene so quickly. How did they ultimately take the shooter into custody? The circumstances of his apprehension are somewhat interesting. He is dressed all in black, completely covered in ballistic armor, as I said, wearing a gas mask and a helmet. So he kind of looks like a SWAT officer, all right? But he's not behaving like a SWAT officer. He's standing by his car, a small sedan, with the door open, and he's watching and doing nothing. So two officers, their attention is immediately drawn to him, and they discern fairly quickly that, that he must be the shooter, and he's taken into custody. One of the things that drew their attention to him is he's wearing a gas mask that doesn't look like the gas mask that's assigned to all Aurora police officers. So he's taken into custody very quickly, and it's, it's at that moment that we have you know, the, the classic chaos of an active shooter event, many, many people wounded, some horrifically wounded, 10 people dead inside the theater, and absolute chaos out front because all the patrons flee to the front where the parking lot is packed with cars and fire trucks and ambulances and police officers are, are arriving. So it, it, was, it was quite a chaotic scene. Jim, from the FBI perspective, do you have any insight on that? The apprehension was textbook by the Aurora Police Department and how they closed in on Holmes and kind of discerned very quickly that he was, in fact, the shooter. And then, believe it or not, and Dan can chime in here, he essentially just gave up. He was still armed. He had more weapons or he had weapons and magazines on him. But the incident itself seemed to almost be cathartic for him. And he was coming down from his adrenaline rush. And he started conversing with the police almost right away. Yeah, and Gina, the cops who arrested him described him as sort of devoid of energy, kind of glassy eyes, as if he had nothing left. Now, we subsequently know that this event was months in the planning. There was no indication that he had any plan after this event to do anything else, like get away or anything like that. It's, this was sort of the culmination of his plan, and it's as if he had expended all his energy. A very important teaching point when I've lectured around the country on this, and I know Jim's heard this, from the moment he's arrested, he is treated properly with appropriate dignity and respect by the officers. And they, they literally know at the moment they arrest him that he's a mass murderer. Despite that, they treat him appropriately. And he immediately tells us, tells the officers two really important things. He tells them that he acted alone. Now, obviously, we have to corroborate that, but that's a really important piece of information that he's probably the only shooter. And number two, he tells them that his apartment has explosives inside it, which is a really remarkable admission for him to make and absolutely vital information for us to know. You know, it's an important lesson for police commanders and police officers everywhere about the value of treating people that you arrest appropriately. It amazes me how quick the response was. The fact the shooter was arrested by police in the parking lot behind the theater within less than 10 minutes of the first 911 call. While all this is happening, tell us what the officers are dealing with and what their response looks like. The Aurora incident, it was the largest mass shooting in U.S. history at the time. In the end, there were 12 people shot. 
one of whom was a woman who was pregnant and lost the baby. So in commemorative events in Aurora, we, we treated as if there were 13 victims who were fatally shot. And then there were 58 who were wounded. So it was a massive event. The rounds that he fired were so powerful that a bunch of rounds penetrated the wall between Theater 8 and Theater 9. And so three people in Theater 8 were shot as well. In addition, as happens in all of these kinds of incidents, witnesses see more shooters than there are. Perception, the human mind, the way it works. And, you know, we have any number of calls and any number of statements, calls to 911 and statements by people to officers arriving that describe more than one gunman. So even though Holmes tells us there's only one gunman early on, we treated the event for several hours as if there was another gunman. And one of the jobs that was given to responding officers was to search the area. The area included a a million plus square foot mall right next door to the theater where a door was open. So when we call for mutual aid and hundreds of officers from the Denver region show up, a whole bunch of them were assigned to the SWAT commander for Denver PD who took over the search of the mall to make sure that there was no suspect there. If you listen to the recordings that night and you talk to the folks, and I eventually talked to all 120-something officers that responded, the initial response, the first 30 or 40 officers, is to go inside the theater where the horribly wounded are and deal with them. One of the first officers in the door is Lieutenant Jad Lanigan, the young probationary lieutenant who was in charge that night. And there's about four sergeants who enter with him. And Jad has the great wisdom and maturity to realize fairly early on in the incident that there's plenty of capable people inside to deal with the wounded, and that he has a greater responsibility to orchestrate the collective response of all first responders. And he actually has the discipline to leave Theater 9 and go out front and direct the larger response. And if you listen to the radio transmissions that night, he does a superb job. Now, in the early, early minutes of this event, with all these horrifically wounded people inside the theater, the sergeants are struggling with how to get the paramedics to where the wounded are. And it's it's fair to say that there was a significant communications breakdown between police and fire. There are a host of reasons why, and there's an after-action report that basically declares this the number one sort of thing we could have done better, even though the response was great. But when they can't quickly get paramedics to where the wounded are inside the theater, there's a decision made by the sergeants to take the wounded out to the back of the theater, behind the screen, out the emergency exit door, to the parking lot, and that's set up as the triage area, and there's a continued effort to call for paramedics and ambulances to the back, and there's no response. So at around the eight or 10 minute mark, uh, Sergeant Steve Redfern, one of the sergeants, makes a decision that we're gonna transport the wounded by patrol car. They start doing that on Sergeant Redfern's order, and then to uh, sort of cover himself, he gets on the radio and he asks the lieutenant for permission to start transporting, even though he's already done it, And I always joke when I talk about this event that we all know that sergeants run police departments. It's not police chief. Sergeants make the critical decisions. And Steve Steve made the decision of the night. And at around the 10-minute mark, officers are putting the wounded in patrol cars, sometimes three wounded in a patrol car, and dashing off. One of the other great fortunate things that happened that night is because it was after midnight, there was nobody on the roads. There's a major north-south interstate in the middle of Aurora right near the theater. And there were three world-class hospitals right nearby, Aurora Medical Center, which we call Aurora South, uh, the University of Colorado, and Children's Hospital, all all within a short distance, all with emergency rooms. And in the end, the most important thing the Aurora Theater event stands for is this concept of immediate transport. If you cannot get the paramedics to where the wounded are, train your cops with basic combat stop-the-bleeding skills, equip them with tourniquets, and get the wounded out. Aurora PD that night transported 27 of the most horrifically wounded people, and all 27 left the theater with a pulse, and all 27 lived. Now, some of them left with you know horrific injuries, including paralyzing injuries, lost limbs, those kinds of things, but everyone transported by Aurora PD in that 10-minute period, between 10 minutes in and 20 minutes in, in that 10-minute period, everybody lived. That is incredible. I'd like to ask each of you, and we'll start with you, Chief. Where were you when you heard about this incident, and what did you do to respond? I'm a hockey player, and I played hockey that night, and I got home around 11.15. I I had a beer, and I went to bed. Uh, I get woken up at around 12.45 in the morning, 
and it's Terry Jones, who's the deputy chief. And we had a system where there's always a senior ranking commander on call as the duty chief. And Terry was the duty chief that night. And so Terry calls me and wakes me up and says, there's been a shooting at the Century 16 Theater. There's quite a few people shot. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, it's probably two gang members opened up on each other inside the theater was, was what he was surmising. And that was my immediate reaction, too, because there was no other explanation for a whole lot of people being shot at the theater. And he said, uh, I'm on my way in, and you better head in, too. So I got dressed really quickly, jumped in the car, and I'm driving in. And I hear on the radio, it's obviously a big event. I'm proud to say that my folks sounded very sort of large and in charge and calm and dealing with it. It sounded like a route of radio traffic about getting people to hospitals. But it was hard to discern what was really going on. Uh, I didn't see any point in calling anybody because I'd get there quickly and could get a report. So I get to the scene and I pull up in front of the theater and it's mass chaos in the parking lot. And Lieutenant Mike Daly, who was the other lieutenant who responded, and Mike was the lieutenant in charge of the SWAT team, is out front of the theater. And he tells me, you know, if you can imagine this as a police chief, he tells me we have 10 people dead in the theater. We have four people dead at the hospital. Ends up that was a miscount. It was two dead at the hospital. Uh, we have a suspect in custody with a gas mask and an AR-15. We're looking for a second shooter. And we don't know how many additional people are shot. Uh, but there are many, many more who were shot and wounded, and uh, we've called for mutual aid, and everybody in the region is coming to help us. I remember being so sort of shocked by the information that I actually I asked Mike to repeat it because I, I guess I had prob trouble processing what was really happening. And so that's how I found out about it. The first call I made was to Jim because I knew that this was huge. I knew we needed help, and I also had a feeling that if this is happening in Aurora, this might be so part of some mass attack, and this could be happening everywhere, you know, in other places in the country. I called Jim. It was a pretty brief conversation. I think I woke him up, and I, I said, here's what I have, and I repeated what, what Mike Daly had told me, and then I said, and I, I need help. So I, I was, I was sound asleep at home and uh, this was really minutes after the shooting. I mean, Dan was on the phone with me, uh, lights and sirens. He was heading to the incident. He called me and I will back up before I go forward here. We had, I, I inherited a tremendous relationship with the Aurora Police Department from my predecessor, Jim Davis, who was the agent in charge of the FBI office before I got there. You know, Dan had uh, worked with the FBI through the Naji Bulazazi terrorism case and a number of other large incidents. We had an attempted mall bombing about a year earlier than this, shortly after I took over. We had some other large incidents in the territory, and we had done integrated terrorism and crisis response training with local, state, and federal agencies in the area less than six months before this incident. So Dan gives me a call. He says, Jim, I, don't, I really don't know what I have. He kind of lays out the facts of the fatalities and how many wounded. And he says, hey, I, I don't know if this is gang violence. I don't know. It seems like we have victims in two different theaters, which doesn't really make sense. Um, this could be terrorism. Just not sure. Empty out your office and get the folks down here. And of course, I've been through a, a number of incidents in my career. And I, I just kind of wanted to talk to Dan in terms of the assets that I could bring to bear the quickest that he needed the most. So I, I thought through, I said, hey, Dan, do you need SWAT operators uh, or bomb technicians or anybody else on the first responder side of the house right now? He goes, he goes, no, I think we have the incident contained. We don't need SWAT operators. But yes, folks that are familiar with uh, IEDs or explosives, that has been mentioned by the subject. So yes, we're going to need that. He goes, but I need investigators, I need crime scene folks, and I just need capacity at this point. So I quickly got on the phone with my three assistant special agents in charge, all of whom were uh, pretty seasoned professionals, and laid out for them what was going to happen. And, and I told Dan that I would meet him at the, at the command post right outside of the Aurora Theater complex, and we would circle up. So I was immediately thinking about capacity because I knew incidents tended to drag on for not just days, but oftentimes weeks. And so I kept some folks in reserve uh, within the field division, didn't wake everybody up. 
and I wanted to start into shifts because I knew this was going to be days and weeks of investigating and uh, and response. And that's how that's how it went. I, I remember trying to just kind of walk Dan through what resources do you think you need right now, and then what do you think you're going to need in the morning, and then I probably met him less than 30 minutes later in the parking lot of the Aurora Theater, you know, where I got in my car and drove down there pretty quickly. Once I got on scene, we kind of met quickly. Dan and I will get into the the media portion of this, but we were already seeing reporters and others showing up in the parking lot in the middle of the night. So we knew we were going to have to put a media statement together, but Dan and I actually talked through as well the two different crime scenes. And, uh, and I told Dan, Hey, because of my background and familiarity with explosives and having a lot of those assets, both in the field office and at the national level, probably best for me to shift over and primarily become the on scene or focus at James Holmes's apartment because it, of what we uh, would eventually find there. And Dan stayed and kind of remained that on scene with one of my assistant special agents in charge, Steve Olson, at the Aurora Theater. Before we get into the apartment, because I know there is a huge surprise waiting for you there, what did collaboration between the FBI and the Aurora PD look like at the initial scene? Now, as you can imagine, 1,100 people in the theater, okay, all evacuating into the parking lot. And us locking down the parking lot and all the cars, because we didn't know what evidence we had and we didn't know what threats we had in those cars. Those folks had nowhere to go. Um, so my cops, again, brilliant leadership at the, at the sergeant and lieutenant level, my cops somehow get some keys to the nearest high school, which is half a mile away, and they get a whole bunch of buses and they cajole hundreds of civilian witnesses who are in the theater to get on buses and go over to Gateway High School to be interviewed. So one of the initial things we needed from these ATF agents and FBI agents and Aurora detectives who were arriving is we had to create an assembly line and process and interview all these civilian witnesses to find out what they knew. And so we did that at the local high school. You know, once we got done with the media scene, I went over to the local high school. To this day, it's one of my most vivid memories in my career in law enforcement and absolutely inspiring. It's 4.30 in the morning, and I go walk into the high school, and you can see desks spread out everywhere in classrooms and hallways, and at each one of them, there's either a, a special agent from the FBI or ATF or an Aurora police detective interviewing a civilian witness, taking statements, and at 4.30 in the morning, so this is four hours after the event, there's still around 50 or 80 people waiting online to be interviewed to do their civic duty in connection with this event. I always remember how inspired I was by that. There was a lot for folks to do. And then, of course, we had a massive crime scene. And we had the threat of explosives because once we understood that this guy was dabbling in explosives and there were explosives at his apartment, we had to treat the entire parking lot, his car, and the theater as if it might have at IEDs. In part two of this four-part series, we're going to talk more about the shooter and the war zone he left behind for law enforcement at his apartment. But before we go, it's important for us at Behind the Crime Scene to commemorate the innocent victims who lost their lives during this horrific attack. Jonathan Blunk, age 26. A.J. Boyk, age 18. Jesse Childress, age 29. Gordon Cowden, age 51, Jessica Gowie, age 24, John Larimer, age 27, Matt McQuinn, age 27, Michaela Medic, age 23, Veronica Mosier Sullivan, age 6, Alex Sullivan, age 27, Alex Tevez, age 23, Rebecca Wingo, age 32. Based on witness accounts, three of the deceased died in efforts to protect their girlfriends from harm. Our hearts go out to the victims and their families. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time behind the crime scene. 
Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne is produced and edited by Lisa Osborne. Theme music is Insomnia by retired IRS Special Agent Clarissa Balmaceda. Find us on social media through BehindTheCrimeScene.com. And don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Osborne.